Hi, this is Joan Driggs, one of the hosts of IRI's Growth Insights Podcast. This special episode is actually a recording of a podcast produced by our friends at the Food Institute, CEO Brian Choi and producer Chris Campbell. It featured me as a guest. In this episode titled An IRI New Product Paysetter Conversation with the Food Institute, we talked about some of the blockbuster brands and key strategies behind IRI's 2019 New Product Paysetters. Hi, this is Chris Campbell, and welcome to the Food Institute podcast. I've also got Brian Choi, the Food Institute's managing partner and CEO, on the line. And today we'll be speaking to Joan Driggs, Vice President of Content and Thought Leadership at IRI, about 2019's food and beverage pace setters, and how the state of the food industry and beverage industry have changed with the coronavirus pandemic. But first, whether you are a first-time listener or becoming something of a regular, we ask that you share this episode on your social media platforms. It really helps us expand our reach, and we really appreciate it that you do so. So with that said, I'll introduce Joan and ask how you're doing today. Thanks for having me, Chris. I'm doing just fine. I'm glad to hear that. So we'll jump right into it. Uh, The Innovation Before the New Normal Report highlights some interesting findings within the food and beverage space. Uh, The successful products that came to market were from both large and small companies, and we also saw well-known and upstart brands. So one of the findings was that big blockbuster products representing those with over $100 million in sales are coming back. And what do you think explains the rise in these blockbuster products? Well, it is super interesting that for the past several years, the blockbuster products, those that were at $100 million or more, as you mentioned, were on the decline. We wondered what was happening, and we attributed it to very focused products. Um that people like manufacturers were more focused on trying to deliver the right product to the right person, less of a let's get this, get this product out there and get as much distribution as we possibly can. But what we found is the larger, and it, they tend to be more, um, a lot of larger manufacturers, still a couple small manufacturers, but they've really upped their game in terms of Uh, marketing and advertising so that we have large social presences. um, And that uh, that's for big and small companies are leveraging um, social media and influencers um, as well as just making sure that they are getting the product to where the consumer is and then continuing to support some of these brands over the years. So they're building up brand equity. So there's a lot of reasons, frankly, for why some of these blockbusters are back in favor. As a follow-up question, Joan, would you say that this year, you know, in 2019, the manufacturers or the the parent companies are better utilizing different parts of social media more effectively uh, versus, you know, in 2018? Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, like one perfect example is um, G Zero, part of the mighty Gatorade franchise from PepsiCo. And in the past, um, you know, a lot of these, like Gatorade, I would say, is kind of a perennial favorite. Like the company just continues to reinvest in the brand, so it's really grown over the years into different um, different product types. And G Zero is like a zero calorie version. But Gatorade also has 1.2 million Instagram followers. So not only is this a powerhouse brand that you've seen as a sports sponsor, an event sponsor, um, lots of great commercials, but they really leverage their social platform. And then they're also using influencers. Like, for example, G Zero, I pulled out some... um, some stuff that I saw with Juju Smith Schuster um, of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, that guy alone has more than a million Twitter followers and more than 3 million Instagram followers. So super influential. So that's a great example of a big company taking a really different approach and almost setting up its own persona, if you will, for one of its brands. As part of your research, um, you delve into different types of consumer attitudes uh, where IRI segments consumers into six different groups. Can you please explain this framework to our listeners and share why understanding these consumer groups is so important to a product success? 
Absolutely. I mean, you know, the biggest challenge I think for marketers or one of the big challenges for marketers is making sure that they're targeting the right audience for their products. Um, and I think typically, you know, for people who are relatively new to the industry, it might be, oh, the profile of that shopper is, you know, a woman between the ages of 25 and 40, or, hey, this is a great kids product. And really, um, there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, we can't really segment co um, consumers by those demographic groups that are so set in stone. Rather, we use um, like, an, we call it Econolink. It's a segmentation, but we look at different attitudes towards um, products, behaviors, what they're feeling. And we kind of, in this, in this instance, we looked at where they were in their mindset, both like economically fragile, um, if they're feeling very positive. And now, again, this is different from pre-COVID-19 to what it is today. So, for example, in a pre-COVID world, 30% um, of shoppers were super optimistic. And, you know, one of the groups that we had um, is called optimistics, and they were 30% of the sample. Well, we're only looking at that pre-COVID segmentation because it's changed dramatically. Like in just six months time, those optimistics are down to 22% of the population. So the groups that we're looking at and these go from the most negative, depressed group of consumers to the more um, positive and economically well-off consumers. They're called downtrodden, cautious and worried, startups, optimistics, savvy shoppers, and carefree. And they represent like different um, portions of the population. So, for example, cautious and worried were 23% of the population, where optimistics, as I mentioned, were 30%. And each of these groups kind of has their own um, like approach, if you will, to new products, to what they're feeling. Um, you know, some of them are, are more enthusiastic about new products. Some of them take a wait and see approach to new products. And it's by focusing in on some of these consumers that you can kind of get a better sense of what your messaging should be. Um, for example, if you really want to go after like those downtrodden consumers or those cautious and worried, you're going to have really empathetic messages that kind of say, you know, we understand what you're feeling and these products are here to help you versus say a savvy shopper who's really concerned about looking around and seeing what else is out there, what compares, not just about price, mind you, but what they, how they deem value. And that's going to speak to shoppers on a different level by saying, you know, this product might have the ingredients that you value most or the, the attributes that we see that you've been looking for. And then versus carefree, where it's like, you know, this might just be for those consumers who are not as concerned about dietary restrictions. They have no economic worries or just super forward and positive thinking. So it's like, what are some of the messages that would um, really appeal to those people? And we've already talked about the different ways that marketers are going after shoppers with um, the different platforms that they're on, whether it's digital, social, print, whatever that happens to be. Well, this is another way of targeting those messages to the right consumer in the right time. And as some of our pace setter products, you know, show, they have broad appeal, but different people are going to respond to different messages. Um, based on where they are in the segmentation on the segmentation spectrum, for example. Moving on to our third question, um, the report that IRI uh, performed mentions that consumers are gravitating towards natural and healthy products. What new consumer trends um, and needs do you expect will become more prominent this year as the world adjusts to this new post-pandemic normal? Well, I don't think that health and wellness um, attributes are going to go away at all. In fact, what we've what we noticed just going into COVID nineteen is that people were 
going after health and wellness in a major way, almost as a way to boost their immunity. Sales of vitamins and minerals just skyrocketed. Probiotics, prebiotics, anything that had those super healthy attributes, people were really going after them. But the fact is, is that health and wellness, um, those are perennial favorites among shoppers, especially since the last recession in like, say, 2008 to 2010, we saw that shoppers or consumers were really taking a personal ownership of their health and wellness. And part of it was to avoid having to make a visit to the doctor. Um, people were taking on even, even products like teeth whitening. Um, which would be an at-home service that normally or previously they would have had to go to their dentist for. People were, it's, it's still kind of a pricey purchase, but it was much cheaper and easier to do it as an in-home service. So all of those things, whether it's personal care or even um, your diet, like what you're consuming, people want to, to take better ownership of their health and wellness. And that is absolutely going to be more the case um, and probably even more heightened as we move into like a post-COVID world. You know, we already know that consumers are um, really buying a lot of products to keep their homes um, more sanitary, more hygienic. That's not going to go away. Um, We've seen, like I've seen anecdotally, just so many different kits, like on-the-go kits for Um, like things to keep in your car, like an extra face mask, gloves, hand sanitizer. Um, I've even seen like new versions of automobiles that are coming out that have different air filtration systems and are, you know, said to be more hygienically, like more hygienic surfaces, for example. Um, So this is something that marketers are already thinking of that they're going to have to take into consideration as we move forward with new products. And as someone who watches new products, I think, wow, what a great opportunity this is going to be to develop new products that help people, you know, reach their own personal goals for health and wellness and for their home. Right. As a follow-up question, you know, as a coronavirus pandemic has forced consumers to eat from home, do you expect they will sacrifice some of the health benefits they previously looked for in favor of convenience? Yes and no. Um, Let me tell you what I did see. In fact, because I've been asked about this, you know, when we saw the pantry stocking that occurred in mid-March, it was all over the place. I mean, people were just, if it was, if it was, had a shelf life and it was in the store, it ended up in their pantry. And so people really have to work through a lot of pasta, um, a lot of rice, you know, some things that might not be considered, um, you know, high protein. It's like, I know that's just one diet, but um, but there's a lot of a lot of things that it's like, wow, if all you're eating is like pasta and rice, how healthy is that? Well, the fact is, is that right along with it, natural products, um, organic products, um, products with healthy attributes, they were selling as well. Um, so it was, I don't think people really gave it up, but it was just odd to see that people were buying so much of everything. I think that as we go into summer, um, summer is a natural time for people to kind of pivot to a lot of fresh produce, a lot of um, healthier, maybe lighter fare. It's in fact, I've had I have one colleague, my colleague Jana Parker, refers to June as the new New Year because people make these resolutions of like, oh, now I'm going to do it. I'm going to make myself, you know, I'm going to turn the corner. And I think that people have adopted or maybe just become more comfortable with the regimen that they had to adopt with COVID-19, with the stay-at-home um, directives. And now they're trying to figure out, okay, how can I work back into the routine, still having to make several meals a day, of taking advantage of what is out there that's seasonal, that's lighter. Um, people who had no confidence or weren't, weren't cooking at home at all really had to start doing that. And now people have greater comfort. Um, in fact, it's just anecdotally, it's really interesting to see how much sales of simple kitchen gadgets have skyrocketed. You know, things like pots and pans and utensils, they're through the roof because people who 
people were forced into cooking at home. So now there's this greater sense of, you know, exploration with new recipes, new ingredients. Um, we see younger people turning to things like fresh ginger. Um, I have a son who's in his mid twenties and, um, turmeric is his new like go-to ingredient, which I think is really interesting. Um, even things like cactus leaves that people wouldn't have known what to do with. And frankly, I wouldn't know what to do with, um, that's really way up there. So it's, I think that healthy eating is going to be here to stay. I think you have new consumers who have had to adopt and are ma still making their way, still learning, still exploring. Um, but certainly fresh and healthy ingredients and recipes are going to be part of that. So I find that interesting, Joan, and I think we can kind of transition that into maybe some healthier drinking. And one of the things that I saw in the Paysetters report was that three of the top five items were beverages that could be classified as better for you. And that includes Gatorade's G0, which we already mentioned, but also Bubbly and Bang Energy. And they were also connected to PepsiCo. So PepsiCo owns Bubbly and G0 and also signed a distribution agreement with Vital Pharmaceuticals for Bang Energy. So do you see PepsiCo taking a larger portion of the overall beverage market because of these moves? And should a competitor like Coca-Cola start moving into these categories a little bit more heavily? Well, I don't think that Coca-Cola is out of the game whatsoever. In fact, Coca-Cola, you know, has its own lineup of, of products. Um, but I do think that PepsiCo in this instance um, is playing to its audience, you know, or playing to audience you know, what consumer needs, consumer demands. I mean, bubbly is a perfect example of think about how many sparkling waters there were on the market. You know, there were a lot, but PepsiCo figured out that by going in, you know, like the way it went in, I would not have known, you know, maybe not being part of the industry that bubbly was a PepsiCo product. It certainly wasn't part of its advertising. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't think that anyone would really associate Bang, uh, which to me feels like a lifestyle product rather than, you know, a standard energy drink. I would never have associated that with Pepsi. So to me, that's more of a distribution partner than, um, than a, like a marketing partner. In fact, um, I mean, Bang has 300 milligrams of caffeine per can. Um, for per 16 ounce can. And then there's little shots that you can get that also have 300 milligrams. I don't really see that as a core um, backbone maybe for a traditional beverage company. You know, that to me is that, that to me doesn't have as wild wide appeal as say a sports drink or even a sparkling water. But then again, I'm, I'm not the audience for it. And clearly, with more than a billion dollars in sales, Bang has created quite a loyal following. So in terms of beverages, like in, in convenience, beverages have always played um, a huge role. In fact, eight of the top 10 um, products in like our, our pay setters for the convenience channel are beverages. Um, so it's things like White Claw, um, which is the sparkling or the seltzer, the um, beverage alcohol seltzer drinks, hard seltzers, I guess you call them. Mountain Dew Amp, another high energy, kind of a hybrid soft drink, energy drink. Red Bull, again, another perennial favorite energy drink. So people still want their energy drinks for sure. Um, so I think that it's moving into... Post COVID nineteen, it almost feels to me what took place back in the last recession, or even maybe it was before the last recession, when we first started seeing a lot of the um, the value added beverages with added vitamins, nutrients. I think now moving into it, we'll be able to see more of those specialty ingredients in some of these beverages. Um, it's certainly been going on for years, but I think that in this day and age. You can get whatever you want, um, wherever you want. In fact, there's even when I had been talking about broader themes for 2020, and this is before COVID-19, of course, one of the things that um, I, I picked up on where there's a couple of home solutions for, I think PepsiCo even has like a hydration station where you can dial up, 
the amount of gas you want in your sparkling beverages. You can dial up the types of flavors that you want. You can kind of customize your own sparkling water or still water for um, your own consumption. There are, Keurig has a drink works, which is kind of like the coffee, the Keurig coffee maker, but it's for home cocktails because even this, again, pre-COVID, people like cocktails, um, but they feel maybe a little intimidated about mixing them on their own. And then with COVID-19 and stay at home, we saw a huge increase in the amount of um, beverage alcohol that's being consumed at home, along with the mixers. So people are experimenting and it's, you know, we're in a day and age where, again, you can have it your way, your recipe, your preferences in just about everything. So to follow up on that with those brands coming in, what would you say social media's role is in promoting these brands and helping them rise to the top of the pay setters list? What I think social media brings to it is that it is a direct link with the type, with the, with similarly or like-minded consumers. So let's take Bang, for example. You know, Bang is, it kind of came out of a company that was focused on like sports nutrition or fitness nutrition and built up a following um, with like-minded people. And it, you know, again, I, I really consider it to be a lifestyle brand because on their website, they have apparel, they have um, other products that really kind of promote the brand, but speak to the people who are part of that loyal following. In fact, they call them banksters. Um, so it's <laughs> knowing the channels or knowing the platforms that those people are, are speaking to or interested in. We have um, a whole social listening, we call it social pulse. It's a whole social listening um, service where if you, you can find out what other topics people are talking about when they're talking about a specific product category brand. Um, so for example, if, if I'm a bankster, um, the other topics that I'm talking about are probably fitness, probably workouts diets. Um, it might be gadgets or apparel that, you know, enhance my performance for whatever physical activity I'm competing in. Um, so you can almost bet, like, what are the other things that these people are talking about? And then that might lead you to some other social channels or some other influencers who, who can speak the same language. So it almost seems that it's not just advertising on social media, but really building a community then. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's building a community. And, you know, it's that same community that can help you frame out your innovation moving forward. You know, when people, you know, almost off the cuff are like, hey, I wish, I wish that, or this would be better if those are true, you know, true input that these, that manufacturers can take to heart and go off and experiment with. So another trend I seem to notice on the Pace uh, Setters report was that cheese it snapped and Pop-Tart Bites were both on the top 10. And I think you can include G0 as these representing basically variations on existing products and brands. So do you think this is a dynamic that other companies should explore investing in, trying to take a legacy brand and trying to put a new spin on it? Yeah. In fact, what I would really say, and we again, we saw this in the last recession, is companies that kind of took advantage of adjacent categories or adjacencies to extend the reach of their brand. And certainly you see that with um, Cheese It Snapped. You know, the way Cheese It Snapped um, is kind of like almost venturing into that chip category. It's a little bit larger in size than a Cheese It. It's, um, it's maybe a little thinner or crispier. It's still, you know, 100% cheese, just like Cheez-Its, but it's just a little bit different. So it's moving into a new category. Um, it also comes in a bag, you know, so it's just a little moving down that snack aisle a little bit. And similarly with Pop-Tarts, um, you know, the it's, it's the same Pop-Tart format, but just in smaller little bites for on-the-go consumption. So it's moving, you know, away from in-home to something that you can put in your in your bag or your backpack and take to school or take to work. 
um, leaving the car for car snacks that you wouldn't normally have done with a regular Pop-Tart. So certainly there are lots and lots of opportunities um, for companies to kind of expand their reach into different into different categories. I mean, one of my, um, like, if you look back at the past recession, um, like Crest toothpaste, that's when they moved into like the whitening strips. Now, they could have just had a new brand for whitening strips, but they took something that already had great, you know, great um, awareness and had really owned one category and just kind of moved it off into something else that spoke to that same oral health care uh, market. So lots of opportunities to get into adjacent categories for growth. So following up on that real quick, you know, I didn't notice when I was putting together my questions, but you are right that the snapped and the pop tarts bites seem to be a little bit more portable, which is something that's in line with other consumer reports I've read in the past couple of years about this, you know, this on the go consumer. Do you expect that's going to change because of COVID-19? Or do you think people will be more interested in this at home, maybe bulk selection kind of product instead of these on the go products? Yep. I mean, we're, we've got kind of a double whammy because, um, First of all, we're not heading off to school, you know, at least for another couple months, and um, people will be working from home more, um, even after offices really open up. I know that um, companies across the country are going to have more consumers working from home. So some of that on-the-go um, convenience won't be quite as relevant in terms of product innovation. We're also, as I mentioned, we're in a recession and in a recession, people want to have more multi-serving products. They don't want to have to, you know, it's it's almost like a different value proposition. They'd rather um, spend, you know, like save a little bit money of money having something that's more of a multi-use packaging than the convenience of on the go. It's like that's something that they can, like, I don't need to pay for that. Um, if I want to take it on the go, you know, maybe I can put it in my own Ziploc bag or something. But um, so, yeah, I do think that that's going to have a huge impact on where product innovation is headed. Great. And so our last question, Joan, is, um, you know, the the research that you performed as part of this report obviously focuses on a pre-COVID environment. And you touched upon this in some of the answers to the previous questions about how, 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 trends have changed in this post-pandemic phase. What are some insights you can share with our audience with, with regards to innovation or developing new products in this new environment? Well, there's a lot. There's, you know, there's opportunities all over the place. I mean, we've talked about expanding into different um, categories, you know, that brand adjacency, if you will. Um, in addition to kind of maybe moving away from on the go packaging, you can take a look at the packaging that you do have. Um, you know, it's not the first, but there's been kind of an, a, a, an increase in extra large packages for cereals, for example, and for beer, beer and cereal, both we've seen like larger pack sizes. Um, so people are kind of taking advantage of that as a value savings, like rather than a box of cereal, it's almost like a lay down bag, like a 35 or 37 ounce bag. Um, so, and again, that's not necessarily new, but we've definitely seen an increase in it in terms of, um, you know, I know from the last recession that consumers were really interested in more like multifunctional or co-branded products where you might have in say, maybe more with home care, you might have a couple of brands coming together to promote something so that you have two solutions in one. I'm sure that there are food and beverage examples of that that come together. You know, maybe it's more with the, the added vitamins or added nutrients where it's a couple of really well-known brand names, but that way people feel that they're, it's greater convenience and they're also saving because they're not having to buy both products. Um, Certainly, like I mentioned that uh, Keurig Drinkworks, which I am kind of keen on. I don't have one, but I think it's just really interesting that people are adopting more of their own customized beverage alcohol. But what I don't see um, that like to me, that seems like a really great opportunity for different spirit companies to like own some of those cocktails that are going into 
um, into those machines. You know, we saw it with, with the pads, the coffee pads and how they took off. And you can have just about any brand of coffee you want in those pads, in that pad format. Well, I, I would think that beverage alcohol could play a very similar role and kind of own, like have branded pads for different drinks and different um, spirits going into those machines. I think that premiumization is a huge opportunity. You know, even though we're in a recession, we are in a unique position because sadly there's tens of millions of people who are unemployed, but there's other people you know, like us who have had their jobs throughout and we might be looking for more solutions or more things that are making us more comfortable or easier to adapt to our time at home. You know, we're willing to pay more for meals. Maybe we're even taking takeout meals. So I think that there's a great opportunity for more, um, like branded meal kits, um, maybe by local restaurants, maybe by chain restaurants. Certainly there's a lot of chain restaurants that are already in this game. Um, But I think that that's a great opportunity moving forward. And then I would also not discount private label. You know, there's a lot of interesting um, opportunities in private label, both in things like I've seen kind of an uptick in, um, plant-based meat products or meat alternatives and dairy alternatives, um, and even things like CBD products for private brands. So lots of opportunities. So I think that about wraps it up for us on the Food Institute podcast this week. Um, Joan, where can our listeners go to learn more about you and IRI? Well, I hope people will visit iriworldwide.com. Um, we've got a lot of free resources and lots of excellent reports. You can even tap into that new product pay setters report that we've talked a good bit about today. So thanks. Absolutely. And we'll definitely share the relevant links in the description of this episode. So once again, I'd like to thank Joan for her time today. Remember, if you're new to the Food Institute podcast, please follow, like, and share this episode. And if you'd like to learn more about the Food Institute, please take a look at the links in our description to learn more about us and what membership could do for you and your company. So until next time, this is Chris Campbell signing off. Thank you for listening. Please become a subscriber and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insights. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.